Hello and welcome to the RoboHub podcast. In today's episode, we take a closer look at one company's efforts to map the sea floor. US-based company Bedrock Ocean is creating a vertically integrated system to survey the sea floor and plans to make survey data widely available to improve our understanding of the oceans. Amazingly, only 5% of our oceans are actually mapped right now, and that's only at the very coarse resolution of 100 meters. That number drops much lower to around 1% for higher resolutions. What's more, since there's no standardization in the industry for how to process the raw data captured from the seafloor, the data we do have can really vary significantly depending on what hardware and operational tactics are used to collect and process the data. And it can also vary significantly depending on what company is performing the survey. So to improve standardization of and access to survey data, Bedrock Ocean is building a fleet of AUVs for seafloor data acquisition, while also developing a cloud platform called Mosaic, to efficiently manage and access data collected from seafloor surveys, including surveys currently being done by other companies and data saved in historical archives. Our interviewer Abate spoke to Anthony and Charles from Bedrock Ocean to find out more. So, hey guys, thank you for joining us on the Robo podcast. Really nice to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Likewise, thanks for having us. Awesome. Yeah. So actually, I reached out to you guys um, because you're covering a field that I'm actually getting a lot of interest in um, and I've been doing a lot of research into it. And um, could you guys give us just a little bit of your background, uh, what you guys are doing, what your backstory is? Sure. Charlie, why don't you start and then I'll jump in and give a little bit on the company. Uh, yeah, sure. So my background's in robotics. I've been in systems integration, different type of robots, you know, kind of touch, have the, have the fortunate opportunity to touch, you know, subsea through space and kind of everything that moves, which is awesome. Um, and our goal here really is take the things we learned in the past from different industries and see what we can do in this space. Uh, basically, you know, we're in the now ocean mapping space and there's a lot of things that can be improved, a lot of things that we can learn from different industries and, you know, having, having gone through some of these uh, lessons learned uh, and also been in the underwater space like there's got to be a lot of places where we can integrate and kind of improve the uh, status quo yeah and charlie's selling himself pretty short he's been at some pretty phenomenal institutions sri spacex and uh deep flight and um you know it's just has seen a lot so he, if anything he's, he's very much downplaying his experience and uh and so my my my, my uh my background is uh i'm a mechanical engineer and I uh, ended up getting into uh, naval architecture and then started a, another company in the uh, maritime data optimization space specifically to try to save uh, fuel for commercial ships at sea. That company was called Nautilus Labs. Uh, Charlie and I actually met while I was still running that company back in 2017 on a you know, diner in the Presidio uh, through a connection that was made and we started talking about mapping the ocean and why it hadn't happened and the technology probably needed to be to make that happen. And uh, we didn't see it coming together at the time and it didn't make sense then. But uh, ultimately, in the, at the end of the day, we ended up getting back together and trying to sort of work out what it would take to actually map the entire ocean. And we started there and looked at the feasibility of what it would take to, to, to really make that happen with a technology first endeavor and worked our way backwards to sort of what you see Bedrock is as today, which is a modern survey and data platform company. Uh, so. Yeah, can you tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing at Bedrock? Sure, um, so at, at the very high level, Bedrock is trying to create a highly accessible map of the ocean. And to do that, you have to solve two problems. First problem is the cost and the uh, operational efficiency of collecting data in the ocean as we as we do it today um, is just not feasible. Or if it is it is feasible, it would just take an insane amount of money and an insane, a lot of, and an insane amount of time. Um, and then uh, the second problem is that even if you could somehow get all of that data, you're left with this exhibit size data pipe processing pipeline problem, data management problem. Uh, and sonar data specifically doesn't have many distributed cloud systems built specifically to do that. 
And so the things that we are doing right now, we're building a vertically integrated survey platform is the way to think about it in the market right now. And we're building software that helps make that data collected, hyper usable, hyper accessible uh, in general. So that's the main two functions of, of the business at the moment. Yeah. So if you were to put that in scale, you know, you say exhibits of data, um, what, what is that scale uh, in something that's uh, maybe more understandable and reasonable? And, and when you say it's super expensive, how much is that cost per survey? It's a, it's a hard question to answer just outright. I mean, you can, you can look or, drain or, or take parallels from the geospatial industry. Think about the earth um, and how much data is collected on land, uh, the ocean in general being you know, over two times the size of that. Uh, and then depends on, again, how much granularity, what the resolution you want, how much quality, how often you want to go back, uh, how deep it is. It's, it's not as simple of an answer as just this is what it is. Um, it, it really depends on the different use cases that you ultimately want to see from that data. Um, but this is akin to genomics. It's akin to large geospatial problems that we see um, in lots of other industries, except as, it has it, as we have it right now, uh, there is an entire just lack of information here. So there's nowhere near as developed. The toolkits haven't been developed to do a lot of the same things that are being done on many other areas. Um, and so it's at its really nascent phases, I would say, of what. And I don't know, Charlie, do you have anything else to add to that question? Because it is loaded. Yeah, um, a couple of things to consider also. You know, one, one thing when you talk about data, data itself, how, how do you utilize that data? Most of the data right now is actually pretty segregated, siloed in very various institutions. Um, repositories and things like that. Some, some are actually on magnetic tapes. You can't even digitize it without waiting you a few months to get the data back to you. So from the shareability of the data, accessibility, and also just interpretation, that's also very, very variable, depending on who you're talking to, the type of output you're, you're looking for. It's kind of like backtrack a little bit. Um, mapping the ocean really isn't the goal. Mapping the ocean literally is the starting point of what we need to do, and at the same time, build the platform to interpret it so that eventually this this amount of data can be accessible so that someone somewhere can make a decision. And that is really, really the important part. It's not just we're going to claim we or any other company or as a whole, as a conglomerate, like we are going to map the ocean. Like that's really just the, the, the tip of the iceberg. That's not even the goal. That's really just like what must happen in order for us to even do anything further. Yeah. And what are some of these things that you're trying to achieve by being able to map the ocean? Why do we need to do it at scale? So the immediate things that we need uh, right now is there's an immense amount of commercial activity um, that's happening. We are transitioning most of uh, our oil-based energy systems over to renewables. And the main way that that'll happen in the United States is through mass adoption of offshore wind. Um, so that's the, let's call it the near shore or the micro view of this at the moment. The macro view, um, you know, we could, we could have an entire separate podcast on what the mid potential downstream effects of being able to have hyper accessible broadly, uh, broad coverage of the entire ocean, but weather models, being able to do things around um, different layers of infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, a troubled ocean at the moment. And so being able to describe its general health with any level of certainty right now is largely impossible. Like you can look at a couple of indicators and you can get a sense that it's probably trending in the wrong direction. But imagine taking uh, a blood sample when you need an MRI. Like that's kind of what we're doing right now with the ocean. And so if you wanted to be able to get into a place and you've seen this now, there's a, it's a new Netflix documentary, I think that just came out where they said they might, you might need to use parts of the ocean to try to change and stabilize our climate. If you wanted to begin to think about ways that you could do that at scale, you would first have to understand what is there. And at the moment we really don't. Um, geothermal processes that could be happening in places we would never suspect, different uh, environments, ecosystems of, of animals that we'd never even thought to go look for because we didn't know that certain things were there. Um, I don't know. Charlie, take, you know, I know you've got other opinions as well on this, but like we could, we could really spend a ton of time talking about this exact point. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to jump in on sort of the, you know, again, the sort of the data side, you know, when we're, when we're taking any type of decision, any type of trend, you know, your sample size is very important. And also the diversity of, and source of that particular sample. And given how, you know, the types of access we have today to the ocean, 
and where we're taking this this amount of data. You know, near coastal is easy to get to, deep sea is a lot harder to. It's very spotty. The 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 frequency in which that data is accessible um, is is very very limited. And so, how are you going to build a trend or a model based on very very limited data, sparse and also skewed in some way, really restricted based on what we can access? So if you draw the dots and you know map it out, there's all these patches of area that when well, we don't know what kind of economical or diversity or kind of biological information we can get out of that. How does that influence temperature? How does that influence trends? How do that, how does those data influence all the other things we're trying to correlate? You know, correlation is also another big, big problem where it's hard to get the data to be able to say this amount of data in this particular geo er geographical area in this particular time frame match with somewhere else. The data just doesn't this, this exist. And so how do you really make an intelligible decision or, or, or a depiction of what that image looks like or whatever you're trying to, to study or, or come from? And so uh, why do we mean to map you know, widely and, and quickly is so we can create a better map of not just the terrain, but also the, the information that's coming out that, is, that allows us to be more intelligible uh, and make good decisions based on that. The last, the last point I just want to add there is that if you can imagine a future where this data is hyper accessible, there are enormous industries and businesses that the entire world relies on that exist in the ocean. And at the moment, we make lots of decisions without a broad understanding of what is really going on. In the future, we suspect and actually think it will be largely necessary that if that data is not incorporated into that decision, you will be doing the wrong thing, not just for your business, but for the world. And it will it, it's no longer going to be this... Um, you know, side thought, or, you know, we're, we're looking at really a complete transformation at the way large business, large industrial business decisions are going to be made across things like fishing. And, you know, your podcast was talking about mining, like, how are we going to do that responsibly? Um, there's a lot of questions there that have very murky answers. And it's not just because that there's a couple of mining companies doing it, right? It's, it's, there is very little data in those areas. Um, and so, you know, we could talk about the philosophical ramifications of this. This is not something that we're necessarily yearning to go do, but, but there are things here where if we don't start getting baseline, just baseline, that's the first step. Like we should not be doing certain activities. Um, and I think that's, and I think Charlie and I both believe that this is something extremely important uh, for the world. Mm-hmm. Yes. And you guys mentioned that there are a lot of different industries and um, people who are doing surveying of the seafloor currently for their own different purposes. Like one example you brought up was offshore wind farms. Um, some other examples that can come up are like deep sea mining, or it would be oil and gas, or say laying uh, internet cables across the, the seafloor. So all these people are doing, um, are they doing a different type of surveying that's specific to their needs um, or is all of this surveying um, standardized across the different industries and then how do you guys fit into that fragmented world of like different types of surveys so i'll i'll give the top level and i'll let charlie talk about the specifics of where we sit within it so um there's lots of different types of surveys most of them start with some broad categories being hydrographic geophysical, UXO, and basically these are titles that you'll see to describe the types of raw data that are collected. So for example, hydrographic, um, usually you'll collect side scan sonar data and multi-beam echo sounder data, and just that. Depends, uh, again, what your end goal will be, what will be uh, which will dictate the resolution, quality, specifications that you try to collect that data. Geophysical, takes the multi-beam and side scan, and it adds on usually a magnetometer, a gradiometer, and a sub-bottom profiler. And this gives you a more complete geophysical understanding of the seafloor. Again, there are nuances to the way that you process and then interpret that data that dictate how it's ultimately used at the end of the day. So this is important for both of these instances because the way we think about processing and being able to do multiple different types of processing quickly ultimately will drive many different use cases as opposed to just, I've collected it once, I processed it once, I've interpreted it once, and now I have this end product that can be used once in one industry. That needs to change. 
And sorry to interrupt you there, but you mentioned a couple different types of technologies there. What are some of the differences between these? Charlie, take it away. Uh, so the, I will start with what's common. Most of the systems, you know, that we use sensors we're utilizing are acoustic, you know, because acoustic and water underwater works really well together. Uh, that's sort of the been been the best kind of perception sort of system uh, or technology per se uh, that that works well in the water. Also, you know, whales communicate all underwater communication systems. There's there's light and sound, and so light has its own uh, you know, optical properties that that work well in water, and then also not not work very well. Uh, given the types of ranges you can get in color and things and such, uh, but most of our systems are acoustic based. Uh, we do have optical based systems on board for very specific uh, types types of survey uh, data collection. Um, if, if, so Anthony had mentioned side scan, multi beam, uh, and so these are these are just different types of sonars that perform a different type of scan. So for example, side scan looks out to your left and your right. Uh, port and starboard in nautical terms uh, to give you sort of like a profile height, rough rough height, not exact, but just a sort of profile with a shape of something that's next to you. Um, you know, for, and then multi beam, for example, is is basically a bunch of beams in a fan and pointed downwards. You know, somewhere between 120 degrees or however you want to choose your setting. Um, and those are just individual sort of like you know, imagine a a lined point cloud, sort of like your old CRT TV. It's just painting, you know, density or height, altitude uh, information across. Across the board, and then as your position moves forward, you create a sort of an image uh, by by combining all these points and lines, and then therefore coming into a two D uh, sort of image from a top down perspective. And so they have they both serve very different purposes, and and they're they're used uh, as a collective to pr to produce sort of what we call commercial maps um, based on whether it's the seafloor type data or whether it's looking for particular objects. Uh, on board, we also carry a magnetometer. Uh, we also carry sort of like forward-looking optical avoidance systems, um, and magnetometer basically allows you to sense sort of the magnetic field around a particular area. You know, within that part, there's different types too. There's you know, scalar versus, um, I forgot the other one. Uh, What's the other one? Vector. Yeah, yeah. So total field vector. So yeah, there's scalar and vector. You know, one gives you a direction, and one gives you just general sort of like magnitude in the entire area. Um, and and so by utilizing these as a com combined system, we're able to not just Able, to, uh, we're able to correlate these things and be able to have a higher chance of success in terms of identifying particular targets and utilize them at the same time. It's it's interesting to think that you know at at the end of the day, uh, like a hydrographic survey, a geophysical survey, um, sometimes it, you're just adding additional sensors. Sometimes you actually have to get those sensors much closer to the seafloor, and that's another big difference between a hydrographic survey and a geophysical survey. So because of the properties um, required, particularly with uh, magnetometers and um, sub-bottom profilers, you need to get those sensors really close to the seafloor um, to get really high quality data. You can do it from the surface, but you have to imagine that to get a sonic boom that penetrates the seafloor down below from the surface and then reflects back off of the different layers of sediment below and then re to then receive that back up at the surface um it's not just extremely loud it's dangerous uh but you know there there are there are nuances that make it challenging and quite power hungry and so the way that we think about it would be much more sensible to put that sensor much much closer to the seafloor you can use a much more uh low powered uh cheaper sensor to do the same work um while also you really concentrate the sound of that sensor just to that very little distance altitude above the seafloor, which dramatically is better for the environment, is better for surrounding marine life. Um, it just makes a hell of a lot more sense. And that's another big difference between, I think, us versus a lot of other players in the market right now is that we do lean toward geophysical work. That, that is ultimately where we think and how we are going to build a really comprehensive understanding of the seafloor here. It's not, it's not just about building a, a gray surface and it's not just about layering a single image over that gray surface so that when I see a blob, oh, that's a rock and not you know a, an old refrigerator. Uh, it, it's about building a much more comprehensive understanding of what the environment is there, what the composition of the subsea or the subsurface of the seafloor is as well. 
and putting all of these things together to build one comprehensive map of the ocean. And this has to be done at scale. And at the moment, we're just doing it in you know small one-off ways at the moment. But we need to get to a place where we can we can do this much more broadly. Mm -hmm. And when I think of a lot of people doing um, surveying of the seafloor, I'm thinking of a person on a ship who's got a, um, say this multi-beam uh, sonar scanner, and then they're just tugging it along, right? But um, one great use case of doing stuff inside the ocean is to use autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, and can you guys touch a little bit about, um, about that in general? Charlie, you want to start on this one? Yeah, sure. Um, one, one thing, you know, man on the water is very expensive. You know, you're using a large ships, you're, you're burning, you know, tons of fuel and, you know, your cost per day is somewhere anywhere between, you know, a hundred, 200, $300,000 a day. And so there's a different level of involvement in terms of serving the data. But if you look at, at the end, end goal, the acquisition cost, the acquisition really is, you know, ping sound, go to, go to some recording device on board and then move that point you know, subs, subs, you know, down the down the chain uh, to cover a specific area that you're looking for. That's really just the onboard energy of move, whatever it costs to move the device. Everything else is sort of like supporting our infrastructure. So if you like take a step back, just like first order, how do we get data? You know, you look at the the cheapest way to do it, the, or the most fundamental first order thing to, to look at is I need to acquire the data. All right, cool. I need a sensor. I need power. You know, I need power to to it. I need to move it around. The other supporting infrastructure, where it's like people waiting on the surface and looking at all those things, there, there's there's obviously requirements and caveats that that come with that and the necessity for those. But majority of things, you know, you break it down into the the fundamental piece is really I need to be able to have something to move around. You don't need a human to do that. The technology exists for for a very very long time to be able to just like mow the lawn per se. You know, it's a typical phrase for covering a ge you know, geometric area with a very you know, repetitive pattern. And so. You know, if you look at that fundamental, like, okay, well, that's been solved. We can use that to gather the amount of data and focus the people really on the interpretation side, the automation, and, and sort of like, how do we make it better, more, make it smarter, make it more available uh, at, the, you know, at, at the same time? And so if you want to scale, it's number of ships, number of people, or a number of robots or, or any type of systems. And the cheapest thing is actually, you know, basically an energy calc. It's like, how much does it cost to move one thing? Is a human moving around, towing around the ship? Is it an autonomous system that run, runs on a really small battery uh, for X amount of time? And you know, your, your ultimate end goal, like how we look at it, is looking at what is the cheapest cost for an area, which is you know, per nautical square mile cost. And really what is gathering the data is something that is repetitive. So if it's repetitive, it should be automated. And put the energy somewhere else, and so that's that. That's that's kind of how we look at it from you know a, a one one lens of a solution perspective. And just to get a little bit more broadly on just AUVs in general, and I think a lot of the questions that we get are like, why you know why did you go and build your own? Uh, why why you know what else is out there? Um, and so the easiest way to think about it right now is that there are extremely expensive, very large, super heavy. Uh, operationally quite challenging to do much with AUVs that exist, and they are survey grade AUVs. They were originally developed for the Navy. Um, and these vehicles are uh, challenging and expensive to use. So you do get these autonomous operations and you do reduce some of the number of people, but you still need ships to move them around. So you get, you get to expand your survey area, uh, but you don't necessarily get any of the um, you do get to drop the cost per square kilometer because you can now deploy maybe four AUVs off of one single mothership, but they're so large and they're so big and they're so expensive that you still need 50 people on board that ship. You need mechanics, you need data managers, you need cap. I mean, like you still need the whole thing. Um, and uh, there's another bit of AUVs, these smaller class of AUVs that have also existed uh, in a more generalist purpose or design. So sometimes they're used for military, often military. Sometimes they've been used for scientific research. Sometimes they've been trying, to, uh, they've been attempted or people have attempted to use them for surveys. Uh, the problem with the smaller AUVs off the shelf right now is the, the reliability of the autonomous systems on board, um, as well as just the general lack of large integrated systems around those AUVs that you really need to keep and maintain a really reliable operation um, out in the ocean. 
And so when we went and looked at the market, we sort of saw these two other classes of AUVs and we certainly weren't going to buy a $5 million uh, AUV over here. We were definitely interested to look at the 250K AUV over here, but then, you know, we, we didn't really get to afford some of the, um, the deeper integrations that maybe we wanted to be able to try to advance the level of autonomy that was happening there. And then ended up in a place where we were sort of had to build our own. Um, and I don't know if Charlie, you want to comment at all further than that, but that's basically the, the AUV buckets that we've seen today right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of it just happens to do with the the integration, sort of how we look at the system as a whole. You know, realistically, a, you know, I think a lot of people focus on the AUV itself. AUV really is like a tiny, tiny portion of the entire problem. AUV literally is just a tool. And, and we can use any AUVs or anything. Uh, you know, we can use ships. We can use use anything to survey the ocean. Uh, the the AUV itself is literally just one part. And really, it's everything surrounding the AUV that's that's considered the problem or the the high cost items. And so, I think you know one one thing to to kind of reframe people's mind is you know, we're not just building a robot to survey the ocean. We're building a platform that supports the interpretation of this data. AUV just happens to be a part of the plan. And whether it's you know other types of vessels or or you know, other existing vessels, which they have a very very important place to play in the current current survey markets. You know they go deeper than than our capabilities. You know they go farther, faster, and and there's a lot of value there uh, and ongoing value as well. But you know how do we utilize all this? You know there's not going to be one company that's going to map the ocean. It's really going to be how do we get all the data together so we can actually cohesively make it useful uh, as a whole. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there are two parts to uh, your business. One is where you're actually doing some surveys with this autonomous underwater vehicle that you're developing. Um, and the other side is this platform that's more general, that's giving people a place to take all their data, combine it into one single cohesive location, and then um, solve some of the other challenges that people face around the data acquisition slash data uh, analysis and making sense of that data. Yeah. And there's, there's an interesting point to make about what we've actually built on the, the, the data, the, the, uh, the data side, which, uh, so we're calling it mosaic and there's a, a lot of tools, GIS tools out there to understand what the final end products are. So like a digital elevation map, for example, like there's a lot of things out there that can handle a dig digital elevation map. There are very few things, and to our knowledge, not many at all at the moment that live in the cloud, where you are able to ingest the raw data itself straight off the sonar. You're able to collate all of the metadata required to do very complex processing needed to then be able to generate that one digital elevation model, which again, back to that point before, for a different client, you might actually process it slightly differently because you have a different engineering need at the end of the day for that end data product. Maybe you need a higher density of points to be included. Maybe you don't care as much. Maybe it's more broad. Maybe it's a downsample version. At the moment, um, you know, even just having this one processed, let's call it library of what the ocean is, uh, you see things a lot of the time like, well, you'll have one ship go along and and it'll go and map right here. And you'll have another one just to the right of it that two years later collects the same multi-beam path. But then the data will, will show this enormous cliff where you believe there to be an abysmal plane. And there's not an efficient, correct way to handle and understand and go back to the raw data, under, look at the metadata that was collected along with it, and then try to understand what really went wrong there. And at the moment, sometimes they just sort of even it out. And that's what they say is the truth. And to us, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So, so we went back to literally fundamentals and said, we've got to get this raw data problem really correct. We've got to understand and organize all of the metadata around it, not just for our own sake, which ultimately was where we started. Was like, this is the correct way you should be doing this. And if we were going to start a survey company, you would want this. This didn't exist. And so we ended up starting to build it. And we realized that literally every other survey company, every other data owner that purchases surveys, any third party data processor out there runs into this exact same problem. And so we tried to create a, a completely different platform specifically tooled for the workflow to get that data from raw, correctly associate all of the needed metadata to know that your end process product 
is actually correct. And moreover, you'd be able to go back and rebuild other end products on the fly if you did it correctly. And that is something that is very, very different. Um, and so we'll, we'll sort of see, but that is, uh, that is just being released uh, soon into the market uh, at the moment. So it's, it's exciting. That brings up a really interesting point that there's, there's multiple different um, data sets out there collected by different people that have different levels of accuracy that don't really match each other. And is this data, the difference in the data that's collected and the metadata? One, I'm curious what that metadata is. Um, two, uh, is this down to different sensors that they're using? Um, or is this just purely the way that they're processing the data varies one to the other? It's all the above. <laughs> it's all of that. There's variables across the entire chain that aren't... Uh, well controlled and there are very few standards for. So maybe Charlie, you can talk about the metadata side of it. Uh, I want to actually start talking about verification. So there's there's a very difficult problem here where you know whatever data you collect, there's not a very tr true and, and proven way to really verify your specific data set. And unless you literally go, you know, side by side with some kind of like imaging kind of measuring really, really long stick and be like, cool, this is, you know, 13,000 meters and whatever, but, you know, that doesn't exist um, like that. And, and so most of it's a statistical analysis or comparative to known, known location, known charts, known previous maps and, you know, sort of like visual observer type, you know, type, type cases. Um, and so how we look at it in, well, well, from, from the raw, raw perspective, we know what needs to happen to the data. We need to track everything that happens in all parts of the processes so that one, we come back and verify, re retrain or reprove a part of, say, like an algorithm we use um, that we're able to verify that the input you know, matches the ex expected output and someone else can repeat the same process so that whatever that gets used on, you have this kind of trail of what exactly happened to the data. And also, if you wanted to run the same, same data set against some different algorithm, now you actually have something to compare against cause, because you know the history of the data, you know it exactly what part of your grab and what has been done to it. So like if you go through a sonar cleaning process, like I'm getting rid of pings that are within a specific boundary that I don't want, but maybe I want that for a different type of analysis. Uh, maybe it's some type of sonar analysis or interference analysis or something like that. Uh, but that's all there. But if we need to know that data set you get in hand is what happened? Like, how did how did it get? You know, how did it get there? What, why does it look like? Why is there a shift? Um, if I massaged it, cool. Like, that's fine. If that's your purpose. But if I want to know specific things about it, like, I need to I need to know what happened. So there's there from the mosaic and our background perspective, there's this like version control, you know, pipeline essentially uh, for all of our data that comes through all of our processes that happen on top of it. So that you when we hand that over to a client, you like you know exactly what raw looked like. So you can verify yourself if you really, really wanted to, you want to run your own processes on top of that. That is totally fine. We encourage that. Um, but we want to pr provide the tool set that allows you to do exactly what you want and need uh, based on your organization and based on the, the types of processing you want to use. Yeah, and I think what Charlie's bringing up is this interesting point, which is there's the industry definition of what metadata is, and then there's our additional side of all the other things that we are collecting, which you only get with a deeply integrated system that allows us to be able to make, even have further confidence that what we're providing as an end product is better. So that's one of the benefits of going with a survey through us. But let's just say you just have... You know, you go to the uh, NOAA NCI DCBC, which is a public repository of bathymetry data, and you went and downloaded a survey on the mid-ocean ridge because you were interested in it for whatever reason. And you got, uh, you get this 10 terabyte drive full of this, just a directory of all of this information. And metadata there would be like the track line um, that the vessel went through. Uh, it would include the sound speed uh, of the water, which actually changes in different thermoclines in the ocean. So you actually have to measure it because when you ping a sonar, particularly from the surface, this is another benefit of taking a sonar and getting it closer to the seafloor. But if you ping a sonar from the surface and it goes through multiple different thermoclines, the speed of sound through those different thermoclines changes and you have to reprocess that out. You have to account for that in the end processing product to get an accurate Again, accurate reading is a big, you know, 
I use air quotes, but things like tide. So tide over the specific point, the GPS point and the time that that data was collected. It can vary by meters depending on where you are in the world, times of the year, all depends. Uh, barometric pressure also matters. Um, and things like vessel offsets or sensor offsets from the GPS or navigational device that you call your, your true uh, zero, zero baseline. And all of that stuff is collected by sensors that have varying levels of calibration, varying levels of, uh, <laughs> I mean, we could go, hey, uh, everything, right? Like you can imagine that some vessels are more well kept than others. Some robotic systems are more well kept than others. And sometimes, especially with a lot of the older systems, when there's a ton of operator in the loop actions, things get missed. Someone doesn't set the timestamp correctly because they're using a Windows 95 machine where they're set to London time. So all the timestamps are off. Things like this riddled throughout this data. It's a, it's a, it's a data organization and cleaning mess. So we thought one of the first things we had to figure out how to do was how to make sure that our data was always going to be treated appropriately. And then similarly, how do we help get everyone else's data organized and know which of it we can trust and which of it we certainly cannot. And this is a broader exercise that will take several years. Um, but it's an important step to get this all right. And there's a, there's another point I want to add on top of that. You know, getting data correct. You know, we're we're not necessarily the ones judging. You know, some level of that. You know, we we are talking to a lot of the actual end users. That's you know, in the end, that's really what matters. You know, there's there's people that have been doing this for a very very long time that know exactly how things work. We're we're listening a lot more than we're just coming out with like, oh, here's a solution, and like, haha, we're gonna sell it. Um, you know, we're we started out with a lot of just like trying to understand what exactly is the problem, talking to people, looking for their pain points, looking through what exactly do we need to fix. Um, it's not just like, oh, we need to fix timing, like, well, what exact timing, what timing between what and what, like, how does that affect downstream interpretation? Like, th those are really, really the the, the kind of I'm gonna call it interfaces that we've been targeting, and so. Definitely working with you know a ton of the industry, ton, ton of people in the field, getting a lot of real data to to test, to go play, and find a way to verify in some ways. Because when when we're collecting data with our robots, we need to know how it's done today. How how do we actually measure it is quote unquote better? And then how do we prove that okay this is acceptable for for whatever purpose they're they're, they're being used for? And so sort of like gain that adoptability and 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 move from there. So you know this is this is. This problem itself is very, very challenging, and you know we're also learning along the way. And you know, thanks to a lot of the people that we've been interacting with, uh, it's it's really, really been a really challenging but fun, fun uh, technical problem across the board. And you know, I think there's a lot of excitement, uh, kind of, it, because everyone's running the same problems, and so very exciting to see like someone and groups of people trying to really solve it so that everyone can win. And I, I think we really are just starting to scratch the surface. Like to get to your point of a. Um, you were asking about processing and like, what are some of the differences? Does it really come down to like a person? And sometimes it does. Sometimes it really does. Um, like unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, and this is again, something that I don't want to, I want to be delicate about the way that I say this, but you know, there is a lot of sort of gut checking on like that ping shouldn't be there. So I'm going to just get rid of that ping. And uh, you know, it looks strange that there would be a random divot there. So I'm just going to smooth it out. Um, there's a lot of manual manipulation of data that happens in the processing process, uh, in the processing process itself. Um, we are trying to make it a hell of a lot easier at the moment to go through large quantities of this data much faster. So a big challenge right now is that there's actually a bottleneck in the processing phase itself um, because there's X number of these people in the world, and they're the only ones with the main expertise to know what's reasonable or not reasonable. You've got people like Noah that has unknown quantities. They actually won't tell us how much they have in the backlog that they don't have enough people or resources to process. It's a very similar thing we've heard at different universities where they have tons of vehicles going out and they can acquire data, but actually getting that into a processed product that they can use in a scientific paper it's been, it, it takes a lot of time. They have hordes of, um, of students that are, that are tasked with helping them do this right now. And at the moment, there are not great tools to help accelerate this process. And if we're going to do this at scale, this has got to get better. This has got to, this has got to accelerate. 
um, beyond what it is today. And so there are areas here that I think bringing in some modern technology processes into this world will dramatically help speed up the ability for us to actually get to these process and products that we all need to, and will need in, in greater demand in the future. Anthony brings, oh yeah, no, Anthony brings a good point about, you know, every, every, every process c component right, you know, currently is, is dependent on people's expertise and experience, which, which is really important because right now there's not no tool or library that really says like, oh, this type of slope with this kind of intersection is going to be this, you know, exactly this type of image. Um, so that, that's super valuable, but there's no real standardized way in terms of like, when you get a set of data, you don't the the expectation and sort of the the word that gets kicked around of like uncertainty it's like every every bit of data you get has carries some level of uncertainty whether it's from the sensor side or just like someone did something to it or i interpreted a certain way like there's no way to at least set an expectation of like the data you get is processed in this way so i know a right angle you know s slope kind of like weird intersection really means these these assumptions it carries a certain amount of assumptions that you're throwing into the data and so if if we if we build a system at least that's predictable in some some metric that at least you can trust it with a certain certain kind of granularity you can start making decisions on top of those things based on that assumption and so i think we're trying to get to that point you know we're not going to say we are going to be the most accurate because we don't really don't know what quote unquote accurate is unless you're like physically they are measuring it um but there's like within the within the industry within how we process data and you know everything carries some level of that unknown and as long as we can bound it and say like well this is good for this type of operation and that you know that the process chain is like tagged and and trust trustable um then then i think that's a, a good place that we're trying to share so not necessarily better in some places but just like predictable yeah no it makes a lot of sense because it's an industry that's dominated by a lot of different players in different industries and um, it's not only that, it's not a new industry. This is an industry that has been around for a long time. Um, and it is changing, but um, it's changing at its own pace. So you, you bring up a really good um, point about NOAA, uh, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And then this is the U.S. government um, agency that is in charge of a lot of things to do with the ocean. And one of the things that they're doing, like you mentioned, is the um, collecting this verithmetry data. Um, and they, say that again. Bathymetry. Bathymetry. <laughs> and um, so this is the resource that it, it's sort of centralizing a lot of this data in one space. So um, how does Mosaic play into this? And are, are you able to take that data from NOAA and then verify it and then standardize it. It sounds like even on the NOAA side, there's, from what you said, there's groups of people who are out there who are um, ver or processing this data so that it's actually able to be published. Yeah, so, so NOAA is tasked, um, particularly the Office of uh, uh, OCS, Oslo Co Office of Coastal Survey is tasked with basically building nautical charts and maintaining nautical charts for the United States uh, economy, essentially. It maintains the safety of navigation at sea by allowing commerce to come in and out of the country through ships. And uh, also just generally maintaining safe navigation around U.S. waterways. And so they, they do their own survey activity. They have four vessels. Um, they can do about 3,300 square kilometers of surveying a year. Um, that's not very much. Uh, just for reference, but they have to re be really highly prioritized about where they send those vessels, where they do that work. Um, this often is associated with areas where you'll see like large hurricanes that come and start to move areas of the ocean that might influence or have uh, damaging effects to ships. Um, so that's one of their main purposes um, is, is, is just to get and maintain these nautical charts. It's not necessarily to do geophysical mapping. Um, it's really just this hydrographic work. Um, and then similarly, they are also required by law to provide that to the public. The current National Archive is held at the NCEI, uh, which is, ooh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher the, uh, the acronym there, but it's uh, uh, National Center for Environmental Information, I believe. Um, 
And their task actually, so, so NOAA OCS collects the information, they generate the chart, and then they archive it with NOAA NCEI. And NCEI is the sort of centralized database for all environmental data that the United States collects with taxpayer dollars. Um, that current database right now, uh, like Charlie was saying earlier, there's a lot of magnetic strips that are sitting in a vault in a mountain. Uh, and it's extremely like this data is not just broadly accessible. It does. You have to actually email someone. They have to go fetch this thing on a rack somewhere in a, you know, probably large warehouse within this geologic structure. And then they will actually write that into a digital form and they'll put it up into some sort of temporary server that allow you to download it temporarily. Um, but this is nothing close to what you would consider like a Dropbox like experience. Um, and so the way that we see it is one, you know, there are, you were saying things like the word verification. We're not verifying any data yet. We're more organizing it and we're, we're giving people a better way to visualize what there actually is and give them modern querying tools that allow them to then access it or give people certain permissions. If it's NOAA data, um, it's already public. And so this is easy. We've actually built Mosaic with a ton of NOAA data. So all of the public data itself, and this is interesting because there's lots of different types of sensors in that NOAA data. So we've been able to ingest and try tons of different types of information to try and get a singular experience within Mosaic. Um, and so it, it plays really nicely, actually, I think broadly toward what NOAA wants, which is to be able to more generally and easily get this information into the hands of people that want it, um, while similarly helping move them over into a bit of a more modern infrastructure stack than the one that they currently have. Um, we could talk at length about this, but it's not really my place to say much more than that. And Charlie, if you want to add anything else there. No, that, that, that covers like the gist, the gist of it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And what's, what's next for you guys uh, with your autonomous underwater vehicle, your platform, everything that's happening at Bedrock? Oh boy. So we're, we're at the, we're at a very fun stage where we're just releasing uh, a lot of our, uh, a lot of our work over the past year and a half into the world. So we are uh, starting to schedule surveys uh, for the end of 2021 and we are releasing uh, a beta signup list for Mosaic. And the things that will come uh, next beyond that, uh, you'll have to wait and see. We, uh, we've got a lot in the pipeline and uh, we're very excited to show everyone sort of where that will go. But at the time right now, uh, we are, we're sort of open for business and we're excited to talk to new, uh, new clients that need help either managing their seafloor surveys of the past, of the current state, or maybe want some additional C4 surveys done for themselves in a bit of a modern, different way. Um, significant different advantages to using the system that we have. Uh, most of the sensors are above 200 kilohertz, which is just generally better for the environment as a whole. Um, the system is much more operable uh, as well as mobile. So we can fly these things anywhere in the United States much more quickly. So there's the, the mobilization and demobilization that comes with large moving ships sort of completely goes away. We don't have to move these things in containers like a lot of the other platforms. They don't have to go on the back of 18 wheelers. You can drive them in the back of a truck. Um, it's just a ton of different options that bring to the table. And then, I don't know, Charlie, anything else you want to talk about on the future? Uh we like to show, so you'll know when we show it. And you know, for from my perspective, there, you know, we're we're working hard on a lot of hardware and software aspects. You know, all the way from acquisition, all the way to the the cloud platforms and uh, customer experience, all of that. And really, it's the how do we make it faster, make the experience better, and also what can we what can we do you know, by taking a step back and looking at how do we do things in a different way that makes sense and sustainable, uh, and it's, that will allow us to continue to grow rather than this is how it's been done and we're going to do the same just because it's the way it's been done. And so constantly challenging the sort of like, is this the right solution for, for going forward? And also looking at, you know, 
how do we how do we, how do we get this data out to people and how we get people to start accessing the data start testing you know one of one of my biggest you know kind of pain point experiences in the past was like looking at some of these you know phd thesis master's thesis you know they're like i spent the entire duration of that time building the tool and then the last month of semester or whatever they're like oh if i had this this is what i would actually be working on and so why not we just provide that platform so that actual science and 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 analysis can actually happen way sooner and so people can not reinvent the wheel over and over again. Granted, there is value in reinventing the wheel in certain things from educational purpose. And you know, we we are a public benefit corp and there are plans in the future for how do we incorporate STEM and incorporate all these other things into our platform at the same time, hardware and software. Um, but in terms of what exactly is next is get more data, get out there and do more cool things and you know find some shipwrecks. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you guys so much for speaking today. That was really interesting. Thanks for having us and uh, always happy to do these things. Awesome. Thanks so much. We hope you enjoyed listening to Anthony and Charles' deep dive into the world of marine surveys. As always, you can access additional content as well as our previous episodes at robohub.org forward slash podcast where you can also find out more about supporting the podcast by becoming a volunteer or patron. Our next episode will air in two weeks' time. Until then, goodbye.